be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is a direct reference to, hey, Adam and Eve, have sex for the purpose of procreation. What is procreation? Making babies. Make more human beings and fill the earth. That's what God says to Adam and Eve. So he blessed them. He says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Verse 31. God saw everything that he had made and behold, notice this phrase, it was very good. All the other days of creation, if you look up Genesis chapter 1, all the other days of creation, the animals, the the land, the trees, the stars, the moon, the sun, all of that stuff, which is amazing, which is incredible, which is just spectacular, God says about all those things, they're good. They're good. But when he starts talking about man and woman and the relationship that he's giving them and the things that he wants them to do, he says this is very good. Very good. So here's the truth. Satan says sex doesn't matter. God says I created sex and I want you to enjoy it as I have ordained it to be. That's God's truth. God created sex, and it's a good thing, and he wants us to enjoy it as he ordained it. Okay, so I get the first part. What, does he, what do you mean by he ordained it? Well, let's take a little, little more dive into scripture. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis two eighteen, verses 21 through 22 and 24. Then the Lord God said, I love this next statement. It is not good that man should be alone. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Are you thankful? Yeah, like I, I would not want a whole nation of me. No thanks. Not even a room full. Um, it is not good that man should be alone. Praise God. So what, is it, what does he say? I will make a helper. Look at this. Fit. For him. Fits with him. Again, I'm not going into the biology, but anyway, that's, that's where it's at. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, that's Adam. And while he slept, God did some surgery. He took out one of his ribs. And by the way, this is significant. Where did God take this out of? He took it out of his rib, out of Adam's side, not out of his foot, not out of his head. He took it out of his side. Why? Because man and woman have equal value in the sight of God. Man and woman have equal priority in the sight of God. There is not one that elevates over another. God looks at man and woman and says, wow, this is very good. And he takes rib out of his side he, put, he places over it with flesh, and then he takes the rib that the Lord God took, and he made into it a woman and brought her to the man. Here's the ordination part. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the very first marriage ceremony where God is the officiant and Adam and Eve are the bride and groom. And the language that he is speaking of here is not of a contractual relationship, but a covenant relationship that is made between man and woman and God. And that marriage in the sight of God is not a contractual or a transactional sort of thing. It is a covenant relationship. A covenant relationship. And that is massive because it's not about what I do for you and what you do for me. It's about we come together as one physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And God ordains that and says, that is very good. 
that is very good. And what he, what he implies here is that through it there would be oneness, that there would be procreation, that there would be selflessness, that there would be faithfulness, that there would be connection, that there would be safety, that there would be pleasure. And just, just so you don't think, because I hear this all the time in arguments that say, you know what, Jesus never addresses these sexualities by name. And, and to that, you're right, he doesn't. But to say that he doesn't address it is not true. Because Jesus and John, in Matthew chapter 19, and, and John as well, but in Matthew chapter 19, a proud religious lawkeeper comes to Jesus, tried to trap him by saying, does the law say a man can divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus said to them, have you not read that he who made them in the first place made them man and woman? It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and will live with his wife. The two will become one, so they are no longer two but one. Let no man divide what God has put together. What does, God, what does Jesus do? Jesus puts a rubber stamp of approval on Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And he says, this is how God has ordained it. This is how God has created it. Just because Jesus does not address something by name does not mean it's okay for us to do. You know what else Jesus doesn't address by name? Kidnapping. He doesn't say anything about kidnapping. Is that okay? No. So just because Jesus doesn't address a particular label that we put on something does not mean that it's okay. So here's the truth. Sex matters to God, and it should matter to us. But here's the thing. Do you, do you realize that sex and that marriage is not the highest call of God on our lives? You're like, what? It's not the highest call of God on our lives. Remember what we said? That one of the lies of Satan? Satan's, one of his lies is that sex is the most important thing, and it's the most important thing for your enjoyment, for your finding a good life, and for your identity. But what you need to understand is, is that it's not the highest call in our life. It's not the highest pursuit in our life. There's, there, there are higher ones. And I love what the Bible says. If you would turn to turn to Ephesians, or I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. If you would open to First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse one says, "Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that." As you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instruction we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. No one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Do you know what a higher call than even sex and marriages in your life? Your sanctification. Your holiness. What does that mean? Those are words that we don't necessarily use very much. Sanctification. Nobody runs around and goes, hey, you sanctified? Um, no. I, but, huh? Sanctification. What is that? What is holiness? It's a, it means to be separate from and to be separate to something. What God is talking about through Paul here is he's saying, 
be separate, be separate from what the world says, or what the world thinks, from sexual immorality, from running around with the lusts that you have, be separate from that. There is a higher calling, and the higher calling is your separation from what the world says is okay to what God says, go for. And what God wants in your life, notice it says, the will of God, for this is the will of God. It is, when you read that, you don't need a question, is this God's will? Do I need to pray about that? No, you don't. It's right there. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would act in your body in holiness and honor. What is God calling us to? God is calling us to say no to the world and say yes to him. Why is that important? Because here's the deal. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been around a fireplace. I have a fireplace in my house. And man, fire in the fireplace is awesome. And yes, this is a metaphor. Fire in the fireplace is an amazing thing. Like when I build a fire in the fireplace, it's incredible, it's awesome, it gives off heat, it gives off warmth, it feels good, it's amazing. But you know what I can't do? I can't walk away from it and just let it keep burning. I can't stand there and stay, I got to stand there and stay guard of what's going on. Why? I even have a screen over right in front of where the fire is happening. Do you know what has happened over the years? There has been times when an ember flies out of, goes right through the screen, and lands on the carpet. And if I wasn't there, if I wasn't paying attention, if I wasn't on guard, if I wasn't trying to keep that fire separate from my house, and when it got out, I put it out, it is going to light the carpet up, and my house is going to get burned to the ground. Are you all catching what I'm saying? The metaphor is, it is your sexuality. The fire is your sexuality. God has created you as an individual with sexuality, and that's not a bad thing. Fire in the fireplace is great, but if you don't guard it with going God's way, that's going to jump out of the fireplace. And my friend, if you're not paying attention, if you're not on guard, it will burn your life down. Are you listening to what I'm saying? You've got, I don't even care. Some of you all are like, Oh, well, we're married and we're okay. No, you're not. If you are married and not paying attention to what's going on in your life, very easily your eyes can begin to wander and your heart can begin to wander. And my friend, the fire can get out of the fireplace and it will torch your entire house down. It's happening all the time. So, so you need to be on guard. And how do you be on guard? You be on guard by taking this higher call and say, you know what? I want to go God's way, not my way. My way is all about immorality. Notice what he says, abstain from sexual immorality. What is that? The word immorality is the word pornea. It is the word that we get our English word pornography from. Now, please don't limit pornea to just pornography because pornea means much more than just pornography. It means any sexual act outside of God's created plan. Any sexual act outside of God's created plan. So let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Keep a finger in 1 Thessalonians, by the way. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Just so we understand how clear it actually is, how clear the Bible is about sexual immorality, here's what, here's what God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the un unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Ladies, you don't get off the hook there. Just by the way, just because it says, nor men. What is, it's interesting to me is the idolaters part. Why is that there? Amidst all these sexual sins, why is that there? Here's what I think it is. I think it is referring to actually the worship of sex. 
the worship of sex. I have to have it in order to be fulfilled. I have to have it in order for my identity to be who I am. I have to have it in my life. I long for it. I need it. I want it. I'm going to do whatever I have to to get it. I am going to worship sex. And if you don't think we don't live in a culture that worships sex, you need to go do some history and read about the Roman government. Read about the Roman culture because that's what they are all about. And, and, and we haven't even gotten to the place that they were at. That should scare some of you. No, no, abstain from that. Run away from that. Flee sexual immorality, the Bible tells us. Well, just in case you're wondering about a little more descriptive, all right, let's go to Romans chapter 1. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 6, by the way. I know, I'm going to have your fingers are going to be all over the place, sorry. Hopefully you've got five. Um, Here we go, Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what we can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. In the first service, I said creepy things. It's not creepy things. By the way, creeping things are pretty creepy, but anyway. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God, check this out, for a lie. Who is the father of lies? And worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged, here's why you ladies don't get off on what I'm talking about earlier, for the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and perceiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. What's the higher call? The higher call is God's way. The higher call is to set myself apart in my mind, in my actions, and in my soul to say yes to God and say no to sin. But can I just say to you, this is not even the highest call. It's not the highest call. Why? Why is this not even the highest call? Because none of what I just talked about can save your soul. None of it. I love what 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11 says. Read this. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in what? In the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The highest call, my friend, in your life is not a what. It's not an idea. It is a person. And his name is Jesus. And what he extends to you is agape love, unconditional love, that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what you think, no matter where you've been, no matter where you go, 
God will always love you, my friend. You can never outrun the love of God. God loves you no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what you're practicing in your life. God loves you, and the highest thing that you can do with your life is surrender your life to the one who can transform your soul, who can transform your life, who can change you from life, from death to life, from dark to light. God is the only one that can do that. Not marriage, not purity, not sanctification, not any of those other things. Only Jesus Christ and him alone. He alone is the one who can save you. He alone is the one who can fulfill you. He is alone the only one that can satisfy you. He alone is the only one that can make all of you become who you are in that Christ in you is the hope of glory. My friend, you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can have a relationship with Jesus as your Savior. And he, my friend, can give you victory over sin in your life. And God extends that to you. And Jesus even confirms it when he says in Matthew chapter 22, after being asked, what's the greatest thing I can do in my life? What's the greatest command I can do in my life? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest action of our life. This is the greatest decision of our life. This is the greatest thing that we can do with our life is not try to fulfill my desires, but fulfill the desires of Jesus Christ in my life. And when I follow after Jesus, he promises to me eternal life. Now what I will say to you is this. He doesn't promise to you that he's going to remove all the temptations. How many of you know Jesus, you have a relationship with Jesus, and yet you're tempted every day? Raise them up. Come on. Look around, y'all. Every single one of us say we know Jesus, and we're still being tempted every day. What? Yeah, tempted every day. But temptation is not sin. Maybe you're here and you're, you are tempted by same-sex attraction. Maybe you're here and you're tempted by pornography. Maybe you're here and you're lusting after somebody. You're tempted by that lust. Listen, Jesus doesn't say, I will deliver you from that. But what he does say is, I'll give you a way out from underneath it and I'll walk with you in every single step of your life. And listen, He also doesn't say, I'm going to make sure you get married because that's the highest thing you can do with your life. No, he doesn't. Marriage is not the highest goal of your life. He doesn't say, you know what, if you'll just be straight, then then that's what you need. If you just do this, then that's what you need. No, no, no. No, no, no. What we need to understand is following Jesus is the highest call in our life. And when we follow after him, he will transform our life truth is, truth is, is he may call some of you to be single. And I, and I want to apologize for this because I know I've taught it. I've almost taught as if singleness is a curse. Like it's a bad thing. That's awful. That's not even biblical. That's completely messed up. Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I wish you all would be single like I'm single. Because you get, when you get married, you get bogged down in the things of this world. He calls it a gift. You're in some pretty good company if you're single. Jesus was single. Paul was single. Singleness is a gift from God. Please don't look at yourself as you're not a gift. You are a gift, my friend. Why? Why? Why do I say that? Because you getting married is not going to fulfill all your fantasies, all your desires, all your whatever. Is it good? Yeah. I love being married. I love the fire in the fireplace. Don't get me wrong. But there's going to come a day, and there already has been. We've had five babies. You know what a doctor tells me after five babies? After each baby, he says, you can't have fire in the fireplace for six weeks. I don't like you, doctor. (laughs) Just being honest. But you know what? It doesn't give me an excuse to go, "Ah, well, we can't have fire in the fireplace, so I'm going to go look for fire somewhere else. No, it does not. 
No, it does not. If you don't catch the whole fire in the fireplace uh, thing, ask somebody near you later, especially if you're a young person and you're like, dude, I just don't get what he's talking about. It's okay. You're going to be okay. Greatest thing that you can do with your life is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Friend, you will never find what you're looking for in sexuality. Church, church, we have work to do. And we have got to do better. We have got to do better. The second part that Jesus says that the greatest thing that you can do, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. You know what the Bible is really, really clear about? Yes, share the truth. But it gets some qualifiers that are very very clear. Share the truth in love, in gentleness, and with respect. You know what else the Bible says? The Bible says the wrath or the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Do you know what else the Bible says? The Bible says the kindness of God leads to repentance. Why am I saying this? Because there's some of y'all that need to hear this because you have treated others who have chosen a different path than you in a way that is not respectful, is not gentle, is not loving, and is full of anger. And my friend, you are not going to get the desired result because the main point is not behavioral change. The main point is soul change, and Jesus is the only one that can bring that. We have got to do better. And, 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 and I will say I have been at, 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 at one of the cheapest of this because even earlier I was, I was saying how we need to get rid of this statement. I, I cannot stand this statement any longer. Hate the sin, love the sinner. That is not in the Bible. That, that is talking about trying to marry two ideas about who God is. God is perfectly just, perfectly righteous, perfectly loving, and none of us in here are God. So when we say hate the sin and love the sinner, my friend, we're not doing good at either one of them because we cannot. So, so what I'm saying is I'm done with that statement. I want to make a statement and say, let's say this, everyone needs Jesus, especially me. That's a massive change in perspective from that. Everyone needs Jesus, especially me. Why do I say that? Because I know I need Jesus. I'm reminded of it every day when I'm tempted. I'm reminded every day when I, when I struggle with different things that are going on in my life. And I know that I need the grace of God and I need the mercy of God and I need the kindness of God's people and the grace of God's people and the gentleness of God's people. I, I love what Kevin and I, when we were talking about how awesome would it be that as a family of God, for those that are struggling with same-sex attraction, those that are struggling with sexuality, that, that this statement would be true of us as a church, that, that we could say to them, if you're struggling with same-sex attraction, you find yourself confused about your sexuality. We care about that. We love you. We want you to have people in our church that you can go to for prayer and encouragement and help. We want you to be able to talk about your struggles without worrying about being rejected for having to face those battles. That's got to be our heart as the body of Christ. That's got to be our heart as those who say we love Jesus. Why? Because that's not just a bunch of nice words. That's James chapter 5 lived out. And you're like, mm, what verse is that? James 5, verse 16. Confess your sin one to another. Pray for one another. So that what? So that healing can begin. 
prayer of a righteous man, woman, is effective and powerful. It's not said to first service, and I'll say to you, and I, I realize we're going over, and y'all are gracious. Thank you. Some of you are like, hurry up, dude. My food is getting, my belly is rumbling. Um, well, it's going to rumble some more. Uh, can I just say thank you? As a pastor, two years ago, you all extended kindness and grace and mercy to me, and you didn't know all the details. But here's what, here's what I can tell you. If that had not happened, I would not be standing here today. I was, I was ain't looking down the barrel of a gun of quit, of throwing the towel, get out of this ministry thing and go do something else. And I'm not lying either. You guys know that. I shared that with you when I came back. But the kindness and grace and mercy that you showed to me as a pastor going through a time in my life that I hope never gets repeated, but I'm thankful for it because it's helped me to grow to a place today where I'm continuing to see what I'm talking about in James, where healing began and it's continuing on in my life. And I praise God for that. Do I still have days of struggle? Absolutely. But my friend, I'm the pastor of this church. We need to be willing to extend grace and mercy and love to every single person that walks into this building, every single individual that watches online, every single person that we rub elbows with at work, at school, at play, wherever we're at. Why? Because the world needs Jesus. And the only way they're going to see Jesus is through you, through me. Not through anger, not through hatred, not through making up stupid statements about people because they act one way or another. Oh, yeah, I said the S word. Sorry. Stupid. I'll say it again. It is. It's dumb. Foolish. Why do we do that? Listen, I don't know where you're at, but I know what kind of God we serve, and he's a God who wants to help you. I want to I wanna encourage you to read this book. Um, things are going to come up on the screen. It's called Gay Girl, Good God. It's by a, a young lady named Jackie Hill Perry. And, uh, man, good, good stuff right here. This is her story, her life unfolding. And I want to encourage you to read it. Her and her husband, um, yeah, God has blessed her with the ability to get married. She didn't, wasn't looking for it, wasn't even thinking about it, but it happened. Her and her husband, they have a, they have a podcast that's called uh, Life with the Perrys. And um, it is excellent. I, I would encourage you to, to listen to it. Um, he's writing a book. <laughs> I'm probably going to need to do a sermon series on this. But um, how to share a truth without wanting to win an argument. Oh, boy. I can just hear the nervousness in here. Um, Y'all, we need to get better at that. How to share the truth without winning, without wanting to win an argument. Mm. You ask God to speak to your heart. What's he saying to you? Would you just close your eyes and bow your head? I don't know your heart. I don't need to. God does, and he loves you perfectly. Friend, if you're here today and you're struggling with something, listen, I, I want to challenge you first off, right off the bat, the very first step you need to take is do you know Jesus? Answer that question. Do I know Jesus? Do I have a relationship with Jesus? Have I put my faith and trust in Jesus? Because here's the deal. You can't do anything in your life until you're willing to say, I need Jesus. And if you're here today and you're going, you know what, I need Jesus, then my friend, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you right now, right here, put your faith and trust in Jesus. You're like, I don't know how. Simple as ABC. A, acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. B, acknowledge the fact that Jesus is the Savior. Believe. Believe that Jesus is the Savior. I guess it's a B, right? Believe that Jesus is the Savior. That he's the one that died for your sin. 
that he rose again and offers you eternal life. Believe that. And then C, confess it. What's that mean? What's the word confess? It means to agree with. When you confess something, you're agreeing with. And in this case, you're agreeing with God. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. I want to begin a relationship with you today. And right now, right here, you can pray and talk to God. But maybe you're here and you're like, I just don't even know how to pray. I don't even know what to say to God. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But listen, this prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. This prayer is just an outpouring of your heart. Jesus saves you. So if you want to pray this with me, you can. It just goes like this. Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you are that Savior. I confess my sin to you. I, I know that you paid the penalty of my sin. I believe that you rose again. And I want eternal life. I, I want a relationship with you. So right now, Jesus, today, I'm saying yes to you. Begin a relationship with me right here right now. Eyes closed, heads bowed, it's just me, you, and God. All I'm going to do is ask you to raise up your hand, keep it up for a little bit so I can see it. I'm not going to call on you. I'm not going to make you come down front. I'm not going to do anything like that. I just want to know who prayed with me and, and so I can pray for you. That's it. So if you prayed that with me and you meant that in your heart, you're believing it, hey, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Y'all, that's that's nine hands that just went up. Woo! There were eight people in the first service. That's 17 people. I I think I did my math right, right? Nine plus eight, 17. 17 people have said yes to Jesus and are taking a step into the family of God from darkness to light, from death to life, from no life to eternity. Friend, you're here and you're struggling with some kind of sexual sin in your life, some kind of sexual something in your life, and you want help, you need help. Listen, we're here to help. We want to pray with you. Some of you this morning brought up more questions More questions like, I've got family. I I don't even know what to do with this. Listen, I want to help you with that. We're here to pray with you. There's some of us up here. There's some in the back to pray with you, my friend. We're just here to pray with you. I don't have all the answers, but God does. And I'm not going to sit here and assume that I can tell you exactly what you need to hear, but God can. So, friend, if you're here today and you're struggling don't. I'm telling you, please, confess it. Ask somebody to pray with it, pray with you, pray for it. Healing can begin. I'm telling you, as a person who's experiencing it in his own life, healing can begin. Father God, thank you for the work that you're doing here, work that you're doing in the souls. God, we ask that you would transform our lives help us to be willing to say yes to you and no to sin God you know our hearts you know what we need so as we stand and as we sing would you help us to just be yes to you whatever that is let's stand let's sing